Well, good morning. It is good to be back with you. It's been a while, and uh, I was um, sad to hear of, of uh, Pastor Kevin's mother-in-law passing, but I was grateful for the invitation to come and share with you again. And next week, you are in for a treat. Hayden is a, a wonderful young man of God, and God has already used him in a powerful way in Las Vegas. He really has a phenomenal story, and I think you will be blessed by him next week. And I would encourage you as a church, consider partnering uh, with the plant that he's uh, planting here in Vegas, and, and I think you'll just be blessed. If you'll take your Bibles and turn to Ruth chapter 1. We're in the Old Testament this morning, Ruth chapter 1, and I just got back on Tuesday from leading a, a group of 32 people to Israel, and uh, it's the what I hope will become an annual biblical studies tour. And um, have you ever tried to herd cats? <laughs> That's what it's like taking a group of 32 uh, to Israel. So constantly making sure everyone's back on the bus. Our theme was, we love you, but we will leave you. So uh, when we say, be at the bus, be at the bus. Um, but we just had a wonderful time uh, seeing the sights, walking where Jesus walked, uh, being in the places where we read about and just seeing them come alive, uh, being in the Valley of Elah and reading about uh, David and Goliath and, and seeing where it took place, being up in Galilee and Capernaum and, and, um, and just all those places, Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi, and, um, and God just really blessed. But one of the, the things that really stood out to me is when we went to Bethlehem. And Bethlehem is right outside of Jerusalem. And it's um, just a beautiful, beautiful place of the mountains, and, and it was very green. Listen, if you ever go to Israel, um, right after Christmas is a great time to go because the weather was wonderful. We walked five to nine miles a day, um, and it's not flat. They, you know, you think for convenience sake, they'd make all these archaeological places nice and flat for us, but they don't. There are mountains, and, and we had varying degrees of athleticism on our team. We had one lady who was 75 and had a cane, and, and uh, we worked with her, and she did just about everything, but, but it was just wonderful. But we went to Bethlehem, and the most famous story of Bethlehem is the birth of Jesus. And we were at Shepherd's Field, which is the field where the shepherds would have been when the angels proclaimed uh, the birth of the Messiah. And it was just beautiful to see. But there's another story that takes place in Bethlehem in the Bible, and that's in the Old Testament here in the book of Ruth. And we're going to look at this book this morning and look at the kinsman redeemer. Now, I will say this, pray for Bethlehem. You know, on the news all the time in Israel, you have the, the Jews and the Muslims who are not playing so well together. And caught in the middle are the minority Christians. And most of them are Palestinian. And in Bethlehem, which used to be a predominantly Christian city, is more and more becoming a predominantly Muslim city as the Palestinian Christians are leaving because there's very little opportunity for them. So pray for them uh, when you think about it, when you come across the name Bethlehem in your Bible reading, remember that there still is a contingency of Christians in that town and they need our prayers. But as we begin today, I don't have time to read the entire uh, book of Ruth, so I'd encourage you maybe to do that this week. So we're gonna hit some highlights, but we're gonna begin with verse one of chapter one. And we're going to set out the story here. It says, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Mahlon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These two Moabite wives, the names of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Mahlon and Chilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons 
and her husband. Then we're going to jump to verse 19. And what happens in between where we finish in verse 19 is that uh, Naomi heard that God had visited his people and that there was food in Bethlehem again. And so she decided to go and she told her daughters-in-law, listen, you're from this land. You just go back to your families. And Orpah did, but Ruth said, no, I'm staying with you and your God will be my God and your people will be my people. And she was faithful to her mother-in-law. And so they decide to go back to Bethlehem. And it says in verse 19, so the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman said, is this Naomi? She said to them, do not call me Naomi. Now, Naomi means pleasant. Call me Mara, which means bitter. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So here we begin this story of Ruth. And and as I I look at this story and I look at what was going on in Ruth's day, to me it seems very comparable to some of the things going on in our nation today. And we began reading, it says, in the days when the judges ruled. Now the book preceding Ruth is the book of Judges. And the book of Judges is really the sewer of the Bible. It's really the darkest days of God's people in the Old Testament. And a pattern went through in the book of Judges. You have um, people falling after the religions of the nations around them, worshiping the Baals and the Asheroth, and and God uh, judges his people and brings calamity upon them. And then God raises up a judge who delivers his people and leads his people. And then that judge dies and the people go back to worshiping the false gods. And it's this cycle over and over and over again. And so that's the context of the story when the judges ruled. And the thing about this are there are two passages in the book of Judges that really stand out to me. The first is in chapter two, what I believe to be the saddest verse of the Bible. And it talks about that Joshua died and was buried with his fathers and that that generation also died and was buried. And it's the Bible says, and there arose a new generation who did not know the Lord nor the works that he had done for Israel. You see, there were two indictments against that generation. They had not led the next generation to have faith in the Lord and they hadn't even told them the stories of what God had done for them. And it's an important lesson that we have a responsibility to pass the faith on to the next generation. And I've seen so many churches that make decisions about what they're going to do and what their service is going to look like and what times they're going to meet based on their current congregation as opposed to what will best reach the next generation. And because of that, every year, thousands of churches close their doors because they failed to reach the next generation. Friends, we have a responsibility to reach the next generation with the gospel. We can't force anyone to be a Christian. You can't make your child a Christian. You can't make your child follow the ways of the Lord, but you can lay the foundation. You can live out your faith And you can tell your children the stories of what God has done and have that child in Christian fellowship. But that generation had not done it. But then the second thing in the book of Judges that really stands out is that twice it says that every man did what was right in his own eyes, for there was no king in Israel. You see, there was no earthly king over Israel. Israel. There was no earthly king over Judah. They, they didn't have an earthly king. They didn't have someone sitting in a throne and wearing a crown, someone who was organizing the army, someone who was, was collecting taxes and doing all the regular roles of a king and telling the people what they could do and what they couldn't do. There was no earthly king. But what's interesting as we begin this story is we find a man named Elimelech. Elimelech is a compound word. 
It's two words put together to form his name. The first one is Eli. Eli means my God. Jesus cried out on the cross, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God. So the first part of his name is my God. The second one is king. And so the translation of Eli Melech's name is my God is king. You see, though Israel did not have an earthly king, they had a sovereign king, and it was God. And they forgot that. And they rebelled against their heavenly king. And it brought judgment on the land. You know, I remember growing up in, in classrooms, you'd stand up in front of the flag and you'd put your hand over the heart and, and proclaim the, the Pledge of Allegiance and you'd pledge to the flag that represents the republic for which it stands, this democracy that we have. We live in a nation that we pride ourselves on not having a king, but friends, let me tell you, we do have a king who is sovereign over our nation. Friends, I want to tell you that Washington, D.C. is not the highest level of authority for this nation, but there is one who has higher authority than any elected official in this land. Amen? And what we see here is that the people of Israel forgot that they had one who was sovereign over them, who had given them instructions on how to live, and they rebelled against it and brought the judgment of God. And the same can happen in our country. When we forget that my God is king and we live as if we have no king, it brings judgment. This story begins saying there was a famine in the land. Why was there a famine? Because of the judgment of God. You know what Bethlehem means? House of bread. The story begins that the, the place that was called house of bread, well, the house was empty. There's a famine because of the sinfulness of the people. Sin brings the judgment of God. And we're going to see that even more as we unpack this. And so here we meet Elimelech and his wife Naomi and his two sons. And it says that they were Ephrathites. That means they were the upper echelon of society. They were the wealthy, the affluent. The famine was hitting them the least. Those who had very little, the famine hit hard. But yet we find this privileged family. And what does Eli Malek lead his family to do? To go live in the land of Moab. We find him trying to run from the judgment of God. Why was there a famine on the land? Because of the judgment of God. And he thought he could run from it. Friends, I want to tell you, you can't run from the judgment of God. Amen? Amen. I think about Jonah. Jonah thought he could run from God and a big old fish swallowed him up. That's a bad day. You know, I don't know what you dealt with this week. You may be stressed out. You may have come here this morning just angry at the world, maybe perturbed with the Lord, but just remember you weren't swallowed by a fish this week. Amen? It could get worse, okay? He tried to run from the judgment of God, but he couldn't. And we find Elimelech running from the judgment of God. And he, who was the spiritual leader of his family, sometimes you'll hear a preacher tell fathers, listen, God's called you to be a spiritual leader of your family. You need to be the spiritual leader of your family. Listen, you are the spiritual leader of the family. The question is, are you a good leader or a bad leader? Elimelech was a bad leader. He led his family to go live, to leave the place that God had given them and to go and live amongst the wicked Moabites. The land of Moab was east of Israel. It's in modern day Jordan. As you drive through Israel, you can see the Moab mountains. And he went trying to run from the judgment of God. But the problem is you can't run from the judgment of God. And Elimelech died. And we see that his boys who had been taken away from Christian community, married the only girls around who were lost, wicked, Moabite women, and then God punished them and they died. You know, again, you can't make your children be Christians. It's not like Islam where a parent whispers a saying into the ear of the child and that makes that child a Muslim. It doesn't work that way in Christianity. Each person receives the gift of salvation or rejects it, 
And no one can make that decision for you. But you have a responsibility to lay the foundation. And here Elimelech took his boys away from the people of faith to a wicked land. And the judgment fell on them as well. And as I said, one of the daughters-in-law left. Ruth stayed. And they decided to go back to Bethlehem. They heard that the Lord had visited his people and now there was bread in the house of bread and they go back and the whole town is stirred up. Now we have to remember that most towns in biblical times were small, you know, usually less than a thousand people. Okay. Sometimes we read these stories and we think, you know, big towns, this, they were small towns. If you've ever lived in a small town, you know that everybody knows your business. All right. I remember visiting my grandparents in Old Stola, Arkansas, and I picked up the local paper, and it had a section, and it said, so-and-so's children are visiting from out of state this week. And I'm like, this is news? I mean, could you imagine the commercial appeal if everybody had family visiting, they had a section, they put it in there? It doesn't operate that way, but, but in small town, everybody knows everybody's business. So everybody knew when Elimelech and Naomi gathered up their boys and headed east to Moab. And all of a sudden, here comes Naomi. Where's Elimelech? Where are the two boys? And who is this strange Moabite woman with her? And the town was buzzing. They needed some good gossip. And here came Naomi to provide it. Is this Naomi? Is this pleasant? Naomi said, don't call me pleasant. Call me bitter. For the Lord has dealt harshly. And she says this statement, I went away full. And the Lord has brought me back empty. You know, that's what sin does in your life. You know, sometimes I think that we believe that God sets these rules just so that we don't have fun. All right, like God's withholding something good. You know, in, in the Garden of Eden, that's, that's really what Satan said. And Satan said, isn't that tree wonderful? And Eve said, we'll die if we, he said, no, no, you'll be like God. God's withholding something good from you. But that's not why God warns us from sin. He warns us because sin takes us from being full to being empty. Now, it may feel great for a season. It may be wonderful for a season, but it's going to lead you to being empty. You may be struggling in your marriage and and things may have not been going well and and you're frustrated and you're at the end of your rope and, and all of a sudden here comes someone else and this person just is the exact opposite of everything you're dealing with in your marriage and you think, oh, this person fulfills me. And you sin. And you find yourself empty. Your family destroyed. Your kids bearing the brunt of your decision. You were full and you came back empty. Maybe you're struggling financially and having trouble making ends meet. And you think, well, if I just take this and I go to the casino, maybe that'll change my situation. And it's with poor stewardship, you blow it. And you come back empty. Sin always leaves you empty. May be good for a season. I'm sure when Elimelech and Naomi, they left Bethlehem, a city in the middle of a famine, and they went to Moab, and there was plenty of food, and there was plenty of opportunity, and, and money was good, and the food was good. They were thinking, this is great. But then the consequences of sin caught up with them, and she came back empty. But what we see here is that Elimelech's line was finished. His two boys had married, but it died before they produced an heir. And all that Emiliac, Elimelech, excuse me, had was going to be lost because there was no heir. And that brings us to the story of the kinsman redeemer. You see, there was a practice in the Old Testament where you could have a kinsman redeemer And what it meant was, let's say I had a brother who got married, 
but passed away before he had a child. It would be my responsibility to marry his widow and to produce an heir so that line would continue. It was the kinsman redeemer. Not only would I redeem that my brother's widow, but I would redeem his property and it would pass down to that generation and his line would continue. You see, sin had caused the line of Elimelech to be on the brink of coming to an end, to being cut off. You know, the same was true years later when the line of humanity was going to be cut off because of sin. But then a redeemer came and his name was Jesus. You see, just like Elimelech, his line was finished because of sin. It was, there was death in the line of humanity because of sin. When Adam sinned, death entered into the world. And our line was destined to be cut off forever. But there was a kinsman redeemer. Look with me in chapter 4. <coughs> Excuse me. It says, now Boaz had gone up. Now, let me fill in the gaps here. They go back to to Bethlehem and Ruth goes out to glean the fields. And what that meant is in the Old Testament, according to the law, farmers, when they went to harvest their uh, crops, they were not to harvest the corners of their fields and they were only to go through the fields once and not twice. And the reason for that is that the corners and then that which was missed in the first time going through would be left there for those who were without to be able to go and to work the fields and glean from the fields and be able to eat. All right, it was, a, it was like a form of welfare, but you had to go out. Um, the, the food wasn't delivered to the door. You had to go out in the fields and, and harvest it, but the farmers left some so that those with need would not starve. So Ruth, here she comes, and coming, have, having married into a very prominent family, now finds herself basically a beggar, goes out, and she's gleaning, and she happens upon the field of Boaz, who she didn't realize at the time, but was a relative, a close relative. And Naomi hears of this, and, and through the process, tells her to go back and introduce herself to Boaz, and she found favor in the sight of Boaz, and Boaz decides that he wants to redeem her, but yet there's one who is a closer relative who has first option. And that takes us to chapter four, verse one. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there and behold, the redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down and he took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Now they're sitting at the gate. That was where all the business of the day took place. It says, then he said to the redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of these sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one beside you to redeem it. And I come after you. And he said, I'll redeem it. Then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm a transaction. The one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. Now that's weird. I don't understand it, but that's how they did in their day. (laughs) Imagine if you go to the bank today and well, to finalize a loan, you have to take off your shoe and hand it to the guy. All right. (laughs) Different cultures, different customs. All right. So, so the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilion and to Mahlon, 
Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Mahlon, I have bought, bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. So we see that Boaz redeemed Ruth. And he took that line that would have been cut off and he allowed it to remain. Now this is a picture of what Jesus would do. Jesus would be our kinsman redeemer. And I want to share with you three requirements to be the kinsman redeemer. First, you had to be a relative. You had to be a relative. In order to be a kinsman redeemer, you had to be kin, as we would say in the South. You had to be a relative. And that's why it was so important. That's why it was necessary that Jesus, being God eternal, took on flesh. Right here in Bethlehem that we're reading years and years and years later, the kinsman redeemer for humankind would take on flesh and dwell amongst us. Jesus had to become like us in order to be our kinsman redeemer. It's an amazing thing when you think about the incarnation that God took on flesh, that he came and dwelt amongst men in order to save us. He became like us. You know, Jesus, the Bible teaches, understands. He can empathize with us in our struggles. He knows what it is to be tempted. He was tempted by the devil. He knows what it is to be tired. He knows what it is to be hungry. He knows what it is to be thirsty. He knows what it is to be stressed. And in the Gospels, we read about him in the Garden of Gethsemane, which means the, the Garden of the Olive Press, and, and where they would press olives with great pressure to squeeze out the juice. We find Jesus being pressured by the, the weight of what he was about to endure on the cross for our sins, and that even uh, blood came out as drops, uh, sweat came out as drops of blood from the pressure. He knows what it is to be under stress and to be under pressure because he became like us. He became our kinsman that he might redeem us. But the second qualification in order to be the kinsman redeemer, you had to have the means in order to redeem. Now we see here that this first guy <clears throat> They said, hey, do you want to buy the land? He said, yes, I'll buy the land. He said, well, there's a catch. There's small print. Keep your sandal on. <laughs> it comes with a wife. <laughs> oh, me. That's, that's a horse of a different color, all right? So, so he says, wait, not only is the land, because the guy thought, hey, yeah, I'll take this land, sure. We'll keep it within the family. He said, no, it comes with the wife so that you can raise up an heir for our deceased brother. And this guy says, listen, that'll mess up my inheritance. And here's what he meant, all right? Stay with me. This is clear as mud. <laughs> the kinsman redeemer would marry his brother's wife, all right? His dead brother's wife. It's a whole different story if the brother's alive. That's, <laughs> that's a reality TV show. That's not biblical, okay? So he would marry his dead brother's wife, and he would raise up an heir, and that, that heir technically, biologically, would be his son, but legally would be his nephew. So that the money that he spent to redeem that land, that investment would not go down his line, but would go down his brother's line. And this guy said, listen, I don't have the means. Yeah, I can buy the land if it's gonna stay in my line, but it'll mess up my inheritance if I buy it. He didn't have the means to redeem the land and Ruth. But Boaz did. And friends, Jesus had the means to redeem us. You see, Jesus was born of a virgin, which means that the sinful nature did not pass on to him. And the Bible says he knew no sin. He lived the perfect life. He was the spotless lamb. He was the sinless sacrifice. Though someone else could volunteer to die for you, their death would have no eternal significance because no one else had the qualification and the means to be our kinsman redeemer but Jesus. 
and he had the means, the perfect lamb of God. He who knew no sin became sin for our behalf. So you had to be a relative. Second, you had to have the means. Third, you had to be willing. You see, the first guy was unwilling. He said, nope, I'm not going to do it. But Boaz was willing. Aren't you glad we have a kinsman redeemer who was like us, who had the means, and who was willing? Jesus laid down his life freely for our sins. You know, when witnessing with Muslims, one of the stumbling blocks that the Muslims that Muslims have with the gospels, first of all, the fact that we believe Jesus is God. They, they, they don't comprehend that. They believe Jesus was a prophet, but they don't believe he was God. And, and one of the things that they'll challenge if, is if Jesus really was God, how they say the Jews, how could the Jews have killed him? You see, even in their faith, they believe that Jesus was a prophet and that God wouldn't allow a prophet to be killed the way that Jesus was. And so in the Quran, it teaches that Jesus wasn't crucified, but one was made to look like Jesus and he was crucified. Now, the Quran doesn't say who that was, but Islamic tradition teaches that Judas, who betrayed Jesus, was made to look like Jesus. God supernaturally made him look like Jesus, and that was Judas who was crucified on the cross. That's what they believe. Because they can't comprehend how God would allow the Jews to kill one of his prophets. But then you take it to another level and you believe that Jesus was more than a prophet, that it was God in the flesh. They really can't understand. How could the Jews kill God? And my response is they didn't. Jesus says the good shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. And he said, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down. And I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. They did not take Jesus' life. He gave it freely. He was willing. The Bible says he could have called 10,000 angels. At any minute, he could have stopped it. At any minute, he could have ended it. But he was willing to pay the price to redeem us. You see, we were destined to be cut off because of our sin. Death, which is the wages of sin, has affected every human from the time of beginning. It was a payment that we owed, a debt that we could never pay, but he was a relative. He had the means, and he was willing to die for our sins. Friend, we can have life today and we can have eternal life forever because of our kinsman redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, it's not about us going to church enough. It's not about us trying to be good enough. We're all in debt because of sin. But there's one who's paid that debt and offers us that gift of salvation if we'll just receive it. Oh, what a redeemer we have. He became like us. He had the means to redeem us. And he was willing to do so. Praise be to God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you that we have a kinsman redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that he was willing to take on flesh. Thank you that he lived the perfect life and had the means in order to meet your standard of holiness, to pay that debt we could never pay. And Lord, thank you that he was willing, that he freely laid down his life so that we might be redeemed. And Lord, I pray for anyone here today who has never entered into a personal relationship with Jesus. Lord, I pray that today would be the day that he or she meets the kinsman redeemer. Lord, I pray that today would be the day that he or she surrenders control to the Lord Jesus. And says, save me, Lord Jesus. Be my redeemer. Be my Lord. And then, Father, maybe there are some of us here who have done that. And, Lord, maybe we're kind of like Elimelech. 
we declare that you're our king, but we're not living that way. And Lord, maybe we just need to come and to seek your forgiveness and to ask you to change us and to cleanse us, to purify us. And Lord, to help us to live the life that you've called us to live. Fathers, we have this time of invitation. I pray that no one would leave here lost, dead in their sins, but they would trust in Jesus. Lord, I pray that no believer here would leave in disobedience to anything you might be calling us to do. Lord, would you work in our lives during this time? In Jesus' name, amen. I'm gonna ask you to stand. We're gonna have a time of invitation. If you need to know more about how to be saved, come. We have uh, people down front who'd love to talk to you. Maybe you just need to come and pray at the altar. Maybe you're looking for a church home and you want to talk about how you can become a member here at Spring Valley. Whatever business the Lord has for you to do today, do it now as we sing. You come as we sing.